Welcome to another episode of the Untitled Podcast. Let's discuss Tim and Jeff Buckley. What you are about to hear is deeply disturbing. Aren't you the girl who used to call me names? Aren't you the girl who used to play a game? I was a man in the ring shape with the say something i don't hate my father i don't resent him existing it's just something i've grown up with all my life and then when you're a kid people assume that you have no mind of your own which at a very early age i did it's my way of resisting people's trivialization of my music if it you know if it should be known and it should i have a great great admiration for tim and what he did tim buckley was just 28 when he died He had released nine albums and died of an overdose. In his youth during a football game, he broke the first two fingers on his left hand, which permanently damaged him. And he later said that this injury prevented him from playing bar chords, but the disability may have led to the use of some of the extended chords, which didn't require bars. So here's another example of an artist who overcame a physical handicap to their advantage. Tim used his voice as an instrument, and he was highly influenced by jazz players and singers and avant-garde artists, but he had also the alternative tunings, and he'd write these very ethereal type songs. For example, he performed Song to the Siren on the final episode of the Monkees TV show. Long afloat shipless oceans, I did all my best to smile, till your singing eyes and fingers drew me loving. And you sang, sail to me, sail to me, let me enfold you. Here I am, here I am, waiting to hold. Song to the Siren's been covered a number of times, but none as effectively as this mortal coil. Long as puzzle, this newborn child, I'm as riddle as the time. Should I stand mid the breakers, or should I lie? But 
He was known as a difficult guy. He had a slot on The Tonight Show, but he was kind of standoffish and insulting towards Johnny Carson. And in another television appearance, he refused to lip sync. And during 1969, Buckley began to write and record material for three different albums. Lorca, Blue Afternoon, and Star Sailor, when he started reaching for the free jazz textures and was very extreme in his vocal performance, ranging from high shrieks to deep soulful baritone sounds. The album, Star Sailor, was a critical and commercial failure. I was in the ring Following its release, his sales declined rapidly and the quality of his live shows plummeted. He was unable to produce his own music and make money. He was almost broke. He turned to alcohol and drug binges. albums of sexy funk, I guess you would call it. Greetings from L.A., Saffronia, and Look at the Fool. These albums are not very good, and he alienated most of his hippie fan base. was to really make a, an almost a, a, an R&B record, make a really a sort of a, a, a white guy Al Green record. And the problem with the record is this is the songs aren't that great. Each and every day He had great lyrics on here about being whipped or spanked, and you know none of the songs got any airplay. But somehow he retained a cult following. June 28, 1975, Tim Buckley completed the last show of a tour, Dallas, Texas, played to a sold-out crowd, about 1,800 people, and he OD'd on heroin that night. You've got the untouched mind of a woman who has answered all the questions before. You've got the free giving ways of a woman who has kicked all the heartache out the door. And Janie, don't you know, Janie, don't you know, I've been trying. Janie, don't you know, Janie, don't you know, I've been trying. I brought to you my tired clothes and weary feet. 
And with a smile you took me in and showed me love again Now it has to be to say goodbye or stay and I don't know But remember please I gave you love that's only mine to give And Janie don't you know, Janie don't you know I've been trying died in debt, owning only a guitar and an amplifier. Not mentioned in this story is that he had a son named Jeff in 1966, and Tim abandoned him. Summer princess, midnight maiden, when I first saw you I just breathed. Into your smile my past went fading Inside your voice my mind was she the lost lagoon We waited, waiting along the streets We went parading, never looking back to where we'd been While Tim experimented with his music, he also experimented with drugs. And while his friends never thought he was a junkie, they were aware he dabbled in heroin. On an ordinary summer afternoon, Tim's experimentation would prove to be fatal. In June 1975, Tim Buckley's lifeless body was found at the foot of the stairs to his apartment. When first examined, signs pointed to foul play even though autopsy reports would later confirm that 28-year-old Tim Buckley died of a lethal combination of heroin and alcohol. Jeff Buckley joins us. Welcome. I was curious as to how you ended up on the bill at the Tim Buckley Benefit concert because my understanding is you, you didn't really know your father that well. and Did you know his music well? He split before I was born. He didn't really keep contact with me and my mom. You know, it was like he went off for, he decided not to be a father. So, just me and my mom. And I saw him once for a week, and then uh, that was two months before he crashed on heroin. Jeff was eight and only met his father once, and he didn't even get invited to the funeral. Living with his mother, Jeff grew up on classic rock and prog. He especially liked Led Zeppelin and Kiss. He found a guitar in his grandmother's closet, and he taught himself how to play. I used to play Led Zeppelin. You know, it's a 33... RPM thing. He played at 45. It was cool. I let the sun beat down upon my face. I to fear my dream. I am a traveler of all time and space. Be my eye of being. And you get the feeling that he was not automatically encouraged to be like his father. But he did love to play, and he became a session player for a little while. Then he started gigging in Greenwich Village. His favorite place was Sine, and I'm not positive I'm pronouncing that right either.
During this period, he discovers singers like Nina Simone, Billie Holiday, Van Morrison, Judy Garland. The road is bitter, the stars have lost their glitter, the winds grow colder, suddenly you're older, and all because of the man that got away. No more his eager call The writings on the wall The dreams you dream Have all gone astray He used to perform like this real eclectic selection of covers that would include Led Zeppelin, Bob Dylan, Edith Piaf, Elton John, The Smiths, Bad Brains, Leonard Cohen, Robert Johnson, and even Susie and the Banshees. started being managed by his father's old manager and in the middle of 1993 he began working on his first album with Andy Wallace producing. Now Andy Wallace is known to me primarily as having worked on the Slayer albums and Nevermind by Nirvana. Jeff assembled a band, bass player Mick Grondale and drummer Matt Johnson, and they spent several weeks rehearsing before they went into the studio. The resulting album Grace in 1994 was his only album put out during his lifetime. Stay. 
what an album. It's one of the best albums of all time, in my opinion, and Robert Plant backs me up on that. He loves this album. In fact, I think that I had read how much he loved the album, and that in encouraged me to investigate it, along with Clay Farmer, who knew Jeff back in New York City. Jimmy Page said that it was his favorite album of the decade. Bob Dylan loved it. David Bowie said it was a desert island disc. Lou Reed, Bono. Of course, the standout track that everybody knows now is Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen, and that's based on John Cale's arrangement from the Leonard Cohen tribute album called I'm Your Fan. Well, maybe there is a God above, but all I've ever learned from love was how to shoot somebody who I've to you. And it's not a cry that you hear at night. It's not somebody who's seen the light It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah 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 Jeff's rendition of Hallelujah is easily the best. That's the definitive version. So Jeff and his band did some touring, and there's a live DVD I have of him. I think it's live in Chicago. And that is really where Kelly and I just fell in love with the dude's voice. I mean, he just is such a pure singer. What happens in the DVD concert is that he starts sort of tuning up and warming up and kind of humming and making these noise that's not entirely comfortable. And then all of a sudden he just slips into that note.
fishes go wild in a rush of wind. The dark angel hears something, watching over them with his black feather wings unfurled. The love you lost with the skin so. you understand what he was building up to and in a way that's how his music always is but i mean jeff buckley's uh, voice uh, i was playing with jimmy in the mid 90s when we had it working with an egyptian ensemble yeah. and we played in a festival in switzerland and jeff buckley was playing and we went to see him and it was mind altering his voice spectacular yeah. singing and so much conviction
So after all the accolades and the tour and everything, he went on to begin work on his next album, which was going to be called My Sweetheart the Drunk. Tom Verlaine from television was supposed to produce the album, and for whatever reason it wasn't working, so Jeff brought Andy Wallace back in. So they worked on some songs, and there's quite a bit of work done on them, but on May 29th, 1997, when he was waiting for the rest of his band to come from New York, he drowned. The irony wasn't lost on anyone that a man who lived for his music would be found dead at the foot of Beale Street where he'd performed before. 30-year-old Jeff Buckley disappeared last week after a friend saw him jump into the Mississippi fully clothed. Despite several searches by police, it was a tourist on the American Queen ready to set sail on a cruise for St. Louis who finally spotted Buckley's body. He had gone on an evening swim, fully clothed in the Mississippi River. And he was caught in a wake of a passing boat. Jeff was 30 years old when he drowned.
but he'll always be known for that voice. It was a particularly distinguished aspect of his music. He had a tenor range that was three and a half to four octaves, I think I read. And so the first posthumous album is called Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk, and it's a compilation overseen by his mother and his bandmates and Chris Cornell that was derived from sessions for the album that he was going to put out. He could have literally been doing anything musically that he wanted to do. I would think of it like I would think of Jimi Hendrix. You know, there's no real way to predict it because he could have done anything. shows a huge amount of promise. It's not finished, but there's a lot of great stuff there that I can just imagine would have been put together perfectly for a follow-up album. So here you have two tragedies, father and son, relatively the same age, two different types of voices, although Jeff was ultimately influenced by his father as well. And since his death, he's been the subject of a number of documentaries. There was one called Fall in Light in 1999 on French TV, one called Goodbye and Hello, that's about him and his father, and there's uh, at least another one in the works somewhere. And in March 2008, the version of Hallelujah was performed by a guy on American Idol, and it caused Jeff's version to go to number one on the iTunes chart, selling like 178,000 downloads for one week. I can only imagine what Jeff would be doing now musically if he was still here, but he would be light years ahead of where he was and he was already light years ahead of the rest of us. Two singer-songwriters, two untimely deaths. A father and son who met just once, but followed each other from life into death. It's been such a long time I was just a child then What will you say When you see my face Time feels like it's flown away The days just pass and fade away What will you say When they take my place 
it's funny now I just don't feel like I'm a man Mother dear, the world's gone cold No one cares about love anymore What will you say when you see my face? Father, do you hear me? Do you know me? Do you even care? What will you say? When they take my place
This has been produced by Donnie Shattuck. Where's that sound guy? Um, can I get any uh, reverb on this? Check, check. No, like, like Jim Morrison, play reverb. <laughs> This is a night, beautiful fun. <laughs> Jeff, yes, Sony. <laughs> <laughs>